instructor Tom is also a professor in the Google Studies and in the And um, he actually helped to design FYE, so the fact that you're sitting here today is due in part to sound. Thank you. I am your opening act for the rest of the semester in FYE. And the rest of the semester begins today. And mainly what we're about for the rest of this spring is the topic of globalization. So I've got some good news and I got some bad news. Which do you want to hear first? The bad news is that the term globalization is a big open, empty word in which you can throw just about anything and nothing really sticks. It's hard to define. And the good news is that just gives you guys that much more to talk about in your seminars. What is it? And where is it going? What's it about? So that's the good news and the bad news. As you can see from most of you, I think, probably have read the first chapter of Global Issues, Local Arguments. It's not a long chapter, just a a dozen pages or so. And, you know, it's very clear there that the definition, a clear definition is, definition is hard to come by. There are strong supporters of the idea of globalization. There are supporters of the idea of globalization. There are moderate critics of the idea of globalization. There are strong cr critics, and, and not least of all, there's a whole lot of controversy about globalization. A lot of it has to do with the definition and how difficult it is to define. Globalization, here's my very basic, simple-minded attempt at a definition. It just describes change. We have a lot of terms that describe change in the human and social sciences, particularly the degree to which humans across the globe are interacting and exchanging. Exchanging what? Well, just about anything. Ideas, products, germs. If you partake in globalization, that could mean that you travel to India and come back with germs. You know, you could go anywhere and come back with germs, but the point is that's part of globalization. Pollution travels around the globe. Technology, as you know, travels around the globe. There are even secrets traveling around the globe. Um, you name it. Uh, so globalization is all these things. But really, it often describes changes that the user of the word has a vested interest in attributing to the world, a vested interest in attributing to the world. Um, it describes changes that the user wants to attribute to the world. So we have one set of changes in the world um, described in your chapter. Um, and some of those changes are attributable to a man named Tom Friedman, a New York Times reporter. And in a minute, we're going to discuss his ideas, but I want to ask you, should we? Oh, no sound. That was the sound of clapping hands. Could you hear it? <laughs> OK. Oh, yeah, that's probably, yeah. Volume. I'm not used to max. Anybody know where volume is? Okay, there it is. Or, or, 
what is your position in the end of this talk going to be on the ideas that I'll bring to you? Is it going to be yay or nay? Um, and a lot of people weigh in on the ideas of globalization. That's its usefulness in a way is to get people to, to, to take a stand on some of these topics. So Tom Friedman has taken a stand. He's a reporter for the New York Times. He's um, also, a, I would call, a supporter, maybe a moderate supporter of globalization. And he describes globalization as resulting in increasing interconnectedness of people throughout the world in terms of communication, trade. Um, and then he goes on to describe it in terms of increasing integration of economies around the world. Don't that, doesn't that sound like positive change to you? Increasing interconnectedness and increasing integration? It suggests, and it must have suggested to him as well, since he titled his book, The World is Flat. It suggests that the world is flat. So what does that mean? It means that everyone has equality in the global marketplace, and that everyone can get in as they wish and get out, and there's fair and equal access to all. So when you look out, there's not inequality of spikes, and, and you know, there's, there's flatness. So that was his take, and it's been much criticized. So why would anyone be opposed to globalization if it um, involves greater integration and interconnectedness? But let me assure you that people have indeed... Oh, that's not going to work. So I guess I need internet access. This is, um, this is a short video of the 1999 World Trade Organization protests. When the World Trade Organization met in Seattle, there were massive protests, police action, clubbing, explosives, tremendous resistance. I don't think I turned on, I, I logged into the internet here, so that may not work. Yeah. So anyway, I was gonna show you a video of these massive protests, and they were protesting Basically, they're protesting globalization. The World Trade Organization obviously represents world trade. And so there was some disapproval, for sure. There was a lot of woo at that event. So let's look at the claim of integration. Increasing integration of economies around the world. Really? A lot of assumptions, this is an, an important point, I think, a lot of assumptions are hiding behind this claim of integration. They're sort of sacred assumptions that are held by neoliberals. Who are neoliberals? Have you heard that term before? Neoliberals are the group of people who feel very strongly about free trade, open markets, free markets, and so on. And packed into these assumptions are, um, well, these, these are assumptions that are often unspoken and in some ways kind of sacred to this group. A fair and equal playing field. The global marketplace involves a fair and equal playing field with equal opportunities for all nations, businesses, and individuals. It's assumed the playing field is equal. Integration of economies happens naturally as a result of privatization and global trade. When everything is privatized, then, then the world starts doing business. And we'll talk more about that idea. Um, and in order, for, in order for there to be full privatization, the economies of countries are encouraged to rely on exports primarily. Whatever they can put into the global marketplace and sell, they're encouraged to do. And that has costs, and we'll talk about those costs. But the, the free trade um, assumption is that it'll be good for everybody um, if economies are driven by exports. Another assumption is that free trade is governed and controlled by the invisible hand. Anyone ever hear of that term? The invisible hand? The invisible hand of the free market. Success just happens. When everybody begins buying and selling and trading, success is a natural outcome of of that process due to the invisible hand. It just happens because people are getting what they want, selling what they want, selling what they do best and getting, and, and getting from other countries what they want. It just happens. 
so the assumption is that as long as the invisible hand, not government, as long as the invisible hand of commerce is controlling the exchange, success is a natural outcome. That's assumption number three. And, and, and number four is simply that everyone would want to do this. Why wouldn't you want to integrate and participate in the global economy? But let's backtrack a little bit because it's important to think about, maybe talk about in your sections, what actually drives globalization. First and foremostly, and never rang quite right even when I wrote it. I'm sure it's not in the dictionary. Increasing movement of people all over the globe, all over the globe. But that's been happening a very long time. People have been moving around the globe for a very long time. First out of Africa, somewhere around 50,000 years ago. Then across Beringia, you know, that land, the, what connected Alaska to Russia, that land bridge that was there at one time. People came down into the Americas. And then, of course, there, there are more than these three, but the Silk Road connected Central Asia to China back in the, you know, um, around the time of Christ, the Christian era. It goes back that far. And that's a really good, the Silk Road, by the way, especially for my class, it's studying China and focused on China. This is a really good example of globalization that happened a long time ago because not only did silk products tra get traded along the Silk Road, but religions were passed along, philosophies, technologies even back then, and even diseases, the bubonic plague was spread um, that way. So migration has been going on a long time. Here's a graph of the Silk Route um, so a lot of movement uh, a long time ago. So globalization's been going on for a long time. And then people are moving around, but they're also trading. They're sharing their stuff with each other. That's been going on since the beginning of human civilization. They've been sharing their stuff. But stuff had no price tag back then. Stuff had no price tag. In fact, in anthropology, can you guess what is perhaps the most important work, the name of the most important work by a scientist who studied prehistoric economies? We're talking way back, the first kind of economy. Can you guess what the name of that, how that was described, the name of that book might be? No? The gift. That was the first kind of exchange way back. But eventually, long after prehistoric gifting had come and gone, a lot of trade of a lot of stuff, story of stuff, led to economic growth and economies of scale, economies of scale, which contrary to what Thomas Friedman and others believe, didn't make the world flat. In fact, you might ask, this is a, a good question to ask in your groups, in your seminars, in your sections, is the world really flat as a result of globalization? Or is it spiky? Richard Florida describes the world as spiky because powerful tools of globalization, wealth and power, even labor, are, are not spread out evenly. They're spread out unevenly causing spikes of power and wealth, not flatness. So that's something you might want to consider in your sections. Is globalization leading to a flat, even playing field, or is it a spiky, uneven playing field? In fact, neoliberals, those who are ideologically committed to free market ideology, neoliberals who are Ideologi ideologically committed to free market economics, they want us to believe that flatness exists. They want us to believe that hundreds, if not thousands, of small players, in the case of food production, I'm talking about small farms. How many of you saw Food Inc. on Monday night? So it's about half, which is good for you. Um, because it's a great film. But the, the 
the myth is that there's all these small players entering the, the, the marketplace selling their, their food. They're, they're basically are small farms. Um, food Inc., the movie, points out that there's an illusion of diversity. If you go into a supermarket, do you remember how many, they, they make this claim that there are like 47,000 different products on the shelves. If you go into Safeway, 47,000 different products on the shelves. The illusion is that there's 47,000 different players in the global marketplace. There's not. There's a small handful of players in whose hands there's been consolidation and concentration of power. And this graph is a good depiction of that. Oh, that's too bad. That's, that's, um, that's a teeny section of food ink. Um, that I wanted to show you, even, even though I knew that, that many of you had seen it already. I wanted to show you, you know, this, you know, they push the shopping cart down the aisles of a giant market and there's, you know, the shelves are overflowing with goods and they, they make the point that the, there's a vast illusion that small farms are behind all these goods, small players and small farms, when in fact it's just not true. These massive companies are behind um, this diversity, this seeming diversity of goods. And there's a good graphic depiction of it since we don't have the YouTube video. Um, all these goods are really owned and sold by just the small number of companies, huge multinational companies. So you, you, you think that there's diversity and, and it looks like the world is flat, but really it's spiky because these are spikes. These companies are rising above the rest and control uh, most of the products. So I want to say that I, I don't want to give you a one-sided view. I mean, there's part of me that does, but but I'm gonna to try to make an attempt to give you the possibility that there's other ways to look at this issue of globalization, not just, um, not just spikiness, not just inequality, not just domination by a few companies. Um, so, suppose you want to start a small business in a country that's um, struggling. Well, you could lobby for you know, a loan from the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. And your country would get the loan and, and distribute money to, to companies that need help. So help is on the way if you want to do business in one of these small countries. But the IMF, if it's going to lend you money, imposes conditions. And you have to follow these conditions if you want the money. The conditions are called structural adjustment policies. And it's well known that the IMF requires and imposes countries to follow structural, to abide by these structural adjustment policies in order to get money to do business in the global marketplace. Some of the conditions that, um, here are some of the conditions that the IMF imposes if it's gonna lend money to a country that needs to get, its, to get going business-wise. First of all, sell all your public services to private owners. Public services like, they could even be the, the, the procurement and distribution of water. Suddenly, the, the IMF says, this, the government can't be you know, um, distributing water to those in need. It needs to become a business. Privatized means it becomes a business interest. Water becomes a business interest. And everything else um, that might, you might think of that's a public service becomes a business interest, including education. Cut taxes on rich people and corporations. That pres presumably gives them an opportunity to, to, to stand up and get strong and, and put their goods in the marketplace, in the global marketplace, and to succeed in the global marketplace. Cut public spending. That's sort of like this, sell public services, except military spending, to keep the budget balanced. Um, again, there's all these measures to, to keep countries from, from falling down 
um, from lack of, lack of means. And, and all these things are supposed to improve the economy, improve the budget, deregulate everything, laissez-faire. These are basically structural adjustment policies imposed on governments. Um, but people don't like them because um, they want public services. They want low cost or free medical care. Not everything can be privatized, right? And so things, services that people are used to, they, they become very protective. So the structural adjustment policy also says, well, you can't democratically vote down these measures. Because it's, it's known that people will resist. So part of the policy is, you know, democracy has limits when it comes to structural adjustment. And they often didn't work. They often didn't work. So what happened? This is, I'm talking about cases now where structural adjustment policies have been imposed and experienced by numerous countries. And what happens? Does anyone, first of all, recognize this picture? Raise your hand. Yes. From the mural walk. Yes. Right. That picture is from the mural walk that this class went on in the Mission District of San Francisco. Let me point out something here. Is it dark enough in here to see this? Yeah? Okay. Just for this slide, let's turn it off. Because I want you to see this, this young girl is sitting on a crate of mangoes or some fruit, some food thing. And on the side it says, for export only. That's what the IMF requires of its countries, to, to take their best products and put them on the global market and not use them to serve the needs of their local population. That's considered counterproductive um, for global trade. And, and you can see as a result, she has nothing to eat on her plate because nobody's growing or manufacturing things for the interests of its own local people. Everything has to be exported now. So she's sitting on a crate that's for export only, and she's going hungry. This is a classic depiction of the basic problem of, of structural adjustment, according to the IMF. The middle class just shrinks. Why? Because free market economics requires that everything, even water and education, be commodified and sold for a profit. And what happens when everything's commodified and sold for profit, well, prices go sky high. They're not controlled anymore by the government. They're not kept at an affordable level. They're left to vary according to market, to, to supply and demand. So prices often go sky high, and nobody can afford them. Wages fall because businesses are favored over labor. And public services disappear, or they're privatized, making them absurdly inexpensive. So the middle class suffers, and it has been shown to suffer as a result of these structural adjustment policies that are supposed to jumpstart an economy and get it participating and engaging in, in an interconnected sort of way with the global economy. It's happened in Chile, in Argentina, in Brazil, Indonesia. Um, and a lot of these places, by the way, have finally turned their backs on, on this, I just was reading something by Naomi Quinn, who writes about, not Naomi Quinn, but uh, Naomi Klein, who writes about these changes. Most, a lot of these countries have turned their backs on structural adjustment. They said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna protect our own country. We're gonna um, control wages. We're gonna um, control public services. And we're no longer gonna privatize and put everything on the open market for, for buying and selling. They've, 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 gotten the idea that it won't work. But let's just back up a minute here. It can't all be that bad, right? Can't all be that bad. And some of you may be sitting in your seat thinking, just that. It can't all be that bad. Because of things like this. In the New York Times recently, an article about entrepreneurs in Vietnam who are doing, they're creating this kind of thing. They're creating characters 
Vietnamese characters for online publication in Vietnam and 3D art for games that Sony or Microsoft or Electronic Arts, as you may, you may recognize those names, they've created the games, but, but in, in Vietnam, several, maybe dozen workers are busy creating stuff like this to go in the games. And they're no doubt succeeding. I think the, the, the headline said, um, as technology entrepreneurs multiply in Vietnam, so do regulations, which is from the point of view of neoliberalism, that's not good. Because neoliberalism says no regulations. We don't, regulations hamstring the, the free exchange of goods. But Vietnam has already gotten the message that it needs some kind of re regulations. I don't know what they are. Maybe they're controlling the wages or controlling the prices or, or taxing imports of these things so that these folks have a chance to survive. These people creating graphics have a chance to survive. Another example, another startup again in Vietnam. I don't know why I was obsessed with Vietnam when I made this, but, um, but this is happening all over the world. There are startups that are succeeding um, in creating goods and products that the, that, um, that the world will recognize as useful and valuable and probably will buy them and use them. So, it's been argued, this is often the criticism of the criticism because structural adjustment and, and unregulated free market economics has received a lot of criticism. So the criticism of the criticism is that maybe spikiness is here, there's not equality, but it can be attributed to the growing pains of globalization, the, gl the growing pains of global trade. They're here now, but gone tomorrow, perhaps. Maybe greater equality and more integration will eventually be achieved when globalization enters a more mature phase. Possible? Maybe. So you have, this is the same book um, from which the cartoons that I previously showed you came. It's called Economics, and it teaches everything about the history the economic history, basically, of the United States in, in um, graphic form. It's all cartoons. It's kind of interesting and well done. Problems are merely temporary. This guy is drinking like a glass of wine or something. The transition may be painful, but it'll be worth it in the long run. He obviously takes sort of a cynical view of this attitude, but it's possible that they're right. Maybe the spikiness is temporary and that it's just a matter of growing pains. In fact, I came across this quote this reading, in a reading um, by a Nigerian-American journalist, I think it's Daya Olapade, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right, um, in the book she wrote called The Bright Continent. She argues that these stressed out African countries, poor African countries, these workers, that the most impactful innovations of the future will come from economies just like that. Not from places where the International Monetary Fund has chosen to grace the population with its structural adjustment policies, but from gritty, you know, people in these countries that really out of their grittiness and out of, the, the, out of their poverty, see what the world really needs. This is the argument she makes in here. They see what the world really needs. So she describes some of the entrepreneurial activity in uh, countries throughout Africa, some of which have to do with um, using cell phones to get medical diagnoses for, you know, simple ailments and, and all kinds of things that, you know, are actually useful. And she's saying that because these people ha are in touch through the hardship of their lives with, with solutions that are actually useful and make a difference, they might be even more successful. They might come up with the most impactful innovations of the future. Um, 
And certainly modern connective technologies are part of the picture of opportunity that she wants to create. And sure enough, cell phone technology and social media, as you know, plays a big role in how some groups are able to um, further their message, get their message across, um, not only within the borders of their, the, re the region that is most affected by whatever issue they're dealing with, but beyond those borders as well, and get people internationally interested. So maybe there's hope, maybe this, the spikiness will give rise to uh, something more equal. So maybe innovation and growth don't require robust Western style capital intensive development after all. That's how we tend to think about it is, you know, without a, a huge business, you know, a, a, a huge accumulation of, of capital and banking systems, um, businesses can't possibly make it. But, but Daya Olapade reminds us that maybe that's not so. Okay, well, another way to shed positive light on globalization is um, the spread of art and fashion. I mean, who can argue with the value of, of art and, and fashion and style spreading around the globe? Who can argue with that? Who can argue with the goodness of that? These are women um, dressed in African fashion styles. You know, it kind of enriches the world to have these styles, these fashions move around the globe and, 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 and cross borders, right? Anybody recognize that band? They're supposedly a Cambodian band called Dungue Fever. But I almost took them off this slide because they, um, they, they actually came mostly from L.A. I think some of the key players came from L.A. And then there's this. Oh, that didn't come out right. This is the Nile Project. Wow. Anybody in here go to that showing of the Nile Project in uh, the Green Center? I think it was the, the early February. Featured were 11 countries that border the Nile River. And they brought their instruments, their music, their technology, their knowledge, and they all just show up and cooperate and share. Pretty cool, huh? How can you, how can you boo that? So it's a mixed bag. Ah, but as a result of these, this fashion spread, when an American fashion chain, it was an American fashion chain that borrowed Ethiopian women's dress styles, the, some Ethiopian women were offended by this because the chain didn't give credit to their original design. And the original design was used culturally in meaningful ways. So they objected, you know, this, you're not using it culturally in meaningful ways. It, it belongs to us and you can't borrow it. So that's, that's boo, right? It's a mixed bag. So, some questions that any student of globalization should be asking. And these are questions I'm hoping that you talk about and bring up in your um, sections. First of all, is globalization the problem? The, the movement of peoples around the world sharing their stuff? Is that really a problem? Or is, it, is the problem the engine of globalization? The unregulated free market capitalism that the, honor, the IMF and the International Monetary Fund insist on countries adopting if they want to play the game. Is that the problem? What if we were to redesign the engine so that protections were actually built in for small players, which apparently Vietnam is trying to do. Protections are built in for small players and for industries that supply basic human needs. Should industries that supply basic human needs be up to the, you know, available to the highest bidder and their products sold to whoever can afford them? If you need water and you can't afford it, should you be denied water? So should protections be built in for the small players? Can we build, redesign the engine so that public services aren't compromised in the rush to privatize? Who wants to give up? 
some public services are useful for people who can't otherwise gain access to those services. This is a little contentious. Can we redesign the engine so that not all information freely crosses borders, such as, do we want all indigenous knowledge to flow across borders? Anybody can have access to anybody's business, so to speak. Indigenous knowledge. How about military secrets? That's contentious. Should, should military secrets be an open secret? Or should they be allowed to flow across borders? And anybody has access to them. There's, you know, right now, if somebody leaks military secrets to another country, leaks US military secrets to another country, they're guilty of treason. And they can be brought to court for, for uh, treason. Um, how about patented information? Pharmaceuticals patent very useful drugs. Do we want them to control how far and wide that information gets shared across borders? Or do we want to limit globalization when it comes to patents? I don't know. These are interesting questions. The pharmaceutical companies claim that we need the patents to be profitable. Um, and we can't do research and development for these life-saving drugs unless we're profitable. So there, there's lots of issues to talk about, right, in your sections? The big question for me is, and maybe this is too big of a question, but, and, I, and it'd be interesting to hear at the round table or any, at any time, what you guys think. Is, is diversity undermined by globalization? I mean, biodiversity, all kinds of diversity is something we want to preserve. Is globalization leading us down a path that will result in one culture? Are we getting so interconnected that the uniqueness and distinctiveness of our different cultures is starting to dissolve? Is it leading to one homogenous ecosystem that by design, the one we want? Will there be one government in the future of globalization? And the most contentious of all, Will there be one mind? Will we all have one mind? Like, I don't know, what is that, the matrix? Well, without diversity, we need diversity. Humans biologically could not have evolved. We evolve as a species physically and biologically based on diversity. Just ask Darwin. Where is he? Humans as... as Animals, organisms that are adapted to their environment, that we're adapted to our environment because of the immense diversity of cultural tools at our disposal. The different cultures provide different cultural tools to adapt to the environment. That's another reason for our success as humans. Don't believe it? Just ask a cultural anthropologist. So what do you want the world to look like? You know, is a long-term question. Do you want there to be a Starbucks around every corner? I don't know if you're in need of a good cup of coffee, maybe. Or do you want the business world to be populated with incredibly distinctive, unique products that are homegrown and, and growing right out of the local cultural landscape? You choose, and that you can discuss. What's that? We have no card questions. Oh, okay, good. Okay. So can I? Can I? Yeah, you can read them. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Because I may not take them and all. And then the third one there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, how does globalization cause there to be a loss of diversity when the products and interconnectedness comes from all over the world? Well, it's a really good question. It does come from all over the world, but aren't we influencing each other? constantly with what we're trading. I mean, it does seem like diversity is compromised in some ways. Should we be taking an anthropology approach and try preserving ancient 
culture, or are we on the path of eliminating culture through globalization? That's a good question. I think, you know, just like regulation um, uh, and mixed economies that combine um, controlled rather and regulated prices and labor um, is probably a necessary ingredient. Also, preservationist measures that that preserve cultures is also a, an important measure to counteract um, the the wholesale elimination of cultures in the global marketplace. I think it probably is a good idea. What do you think? To pre actively preserve cultures that would otherwise go under in the global marketplace. Doesn't it seem like a good idea? Do you want to have, do you want to be able, do you want to know that there are these interesting, if also weird to us, cultures that exist in other places around the world? I mean, can't we learn from them some things? We don't want them to vanish, do we? What would the world look like with corporations and economy that was nationalized rather than privatized? Yeah. Um, that takes it to the other extreme, doesn't it? That's what the neoliberals fear most, is a nationalized economy. And that hasn't worked well either. Um, anytime a, a, a state the federal government has taken over all the resources of a the country, they haven't been able to manage it very well. They haven't been able to preserve the well-being of, of their people. So neither extreme seems to be a good one, either complete nationalization of the economy or complete privatization. Neither extreme. As Naomi Klein says, it's a, you know, it's a mixed economy that, that's necessary. What would, com what would complete globalization look like? And what would be the cost? I don't know, because I don't think I can tell you what globalization exactly is. So I certainly can't tell you what complete globalization exactly is. So that's a tough one to answer. Do you think that at some point there will be no, complete and total globalization? Integration of all cultures, ideas. Um, I don't think that it's possible. I think that there's going to be diversity no matter what. It's how we handle it, how we relate to all the diversity. Do we promote it? Um, do, we, do, are, are we, do we give diverse players in the global system more opportunity to influence the global system? Or do we let only the dominant players with more power um, play? And, and, and shove to the sidelines the, the less powerful. Um, I think we do need to promote diversity actively um, in, in the world because of globalization. Any other questions? Yeah? There is some good ways to promote diversity. Yeah, well, I don't know who asked the question about um, um, preserving cultures, that wasn't you, wasn't it? Preserving cultures um, is probably a good way. When we see that a culture is endangered, you're making an effort to, um, to preserve its knowledge, preserve its, you know, knowledge is a big one, because cultures all around the world have very unique sets of knowledge. And, and making an effort to preserve what they know um, is, is, I think, an important thing to do. And there are, there are groups that preserve cultural knowledge of local groups. And also just equalizing the playing field, you know, gives, you know, Vietnamese motorbike manufacturers or graphic designers a chance to get out and get their, get their stuff known and get people interested. There may be people in Africa, you know, following Daya Alapade's wisdom up here, there might be people in Africa who come up with, with innovations, tech innovations or other, it could be anything. Um, innovations, technology, um, you know, who knows what else, clothing, food, that, that are attractive and interesting to other people. We don't want to squash those possibilities. So we want to make sure they have a fair and equal chance to, to have a voice in the global marketplace. As long as global market, global markets are run by 
and the ideology of free um, trade, uh, it, it doesn't seem to allow for the small players to have a voice. Any other questions? Are you going to take these questions with you to your seminars? Who can, tell, who can say what you think is the most pressing issue about globalization today? What do you think is the most pressing issue? I, it, judging by these cards, it would be diversity. Anybody else? What's that? The, 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 the fairness and the inequality. Yeah, that's another thing that it's, it's uh, the middle class disappears and inequality rises. We don't need that. That's not good for the world. All right, then. Thank you all.